Hello, hello, Vetfolio Voice peeps. Welcome back. So glad you've joined us for this episode, sponsored in part by DECRA. It's always a good one when we're joined by the one and only Tammy Grubb. She's so fun to talk to, and she has lots of great practical insight when it comes to sedation and anesthesia in our patients. In this episode, Dr. Grubb and I discuss procedural sedation, or sedating patients for procedures, even seemingly minor ones like ear cleanings, that would require at least a moderate amount of restraint. Sedating for minor procedures may seem like a lot of work, but as Dr. Grubb and I discuss, it can have a myriad of benefits to the patient, to the staff, and just to the clinic in general. We also discuss techniques like local blocks and pre-visit anxiolytics to help get these anxious critters through the door and back home with the minimal amount of stress possible. As I mentioned, I'm joined by Dr. Tammy Grubb, who is a joy to talk to. She's so upbeat and she's full of great advice. Dr. Grubb is a diplomate of the American College of Veterinary Anesthesia and Analgesia with a strong focus in pain management. She owns an anesthesia and analgesia continuing education consulting practice, which serves both small and large animals. Dr. Grubb is a national and international educator and lecturer, certified acupuncturist, and adjunct professor of anesthesia and analgesia at Washington State, and is the president-elect of the International Veterinary Academy of Pain Management. She's co-author of two books, including Veterinary Anesthesia and Pain Management for Nurses and Technicians. Dr. Grubb's favorite achievement is winning the Distinguished Teaching Award at two universities. So if you want to learn more about how to handle patients with less stress for all involved, you're in the right place. Let's go ahead and get into our episode. Well, I am very excited to have Dr. Tammy Grubb joining me today to talk about procedural sedation. Dr. Grubb, thank you so much for joining me today. Dr. Cassie, thanks back. It's always great to work with you. Yes, you as well. I'm very excited we're doing this podcast together. I am too. I think it's going to be a lot of fun. You picked a great topic. I was going to say, this is something I'm very excited to talk about because I think it's, it's probably very underused and, and something we can do a lot more of. I, I totally agree with you. All the time I see veterinarians, I do a lot of consulting in people's practices and I see veterinarians and veterinary nurses struggling with patients, wrestling with patients for procedures that just a little bit of sedation would make a huge difference for that animal and for everybody involved. Yes, just make everybody's life better and a little bit easier. So let's kind of start with the basics. When we're talking about procedural sedation and analgesia, what exactly are we referring to? It really is exactly as it sounds. It means just what the word says. It's sedation for a seemingly minor procedure that is being done without anesthesia. And these are, they're often stressful because they require restraint And they can also be uncomfortable, if not outright painful. And doing them without sedation, as we just said, that's really to the detriment of the pet and the nurses and the veterinarians. What it causes in that pet is it can cause physical health issues and it causes stress and anxiety and fear. And the problem is once that fear and anxiety and stress is established as coming from that vet clinic, it's really hard for the animal to overcome that and and want to come back to the clinic. So using sedation, and it can be light sedation, it doesn't have to be a really deeply sedated pet, just light sedation to achieve what we were achieving with restraint. It's a lot less stressful. And then adding in some analgesia that's appropriate for that procedure then also decreases the pain because of course, pain can also add to that fear and anxiety and stress. And it's not only good medicine, it's just really the right thing to do for the pet. And again, every all the humans involved as well. So this procedural sedation with analgesia is, is really catching on. So it's a very timely topic now, even though, like you said, it is still underused. We're going to fix that. You and I, Dr. Cassie. I'm with you. I'm for it because it always, you know, we love what we do as 
veterinarians and veterinary professionals. And it always breaks my heart when, you know, you see a dog in the parking lot and they're already shaking before they even get to the door. So, and you know, that's not fun for the pet owner or anything like that. So anything we can do to, like you said, reduce that anxiety, reduce that negative experience for, um, you know, for mom and dad and for the pet and just give everybody a better experience with the whole visit is a positive. Uh, I, t- I totally agree. And, you know, it, I, I think it sounds like we're exactly the same. It, it makes me so sad to see those animals shaking in fear when they come in our vet clinic. You know, we, we didn't go to veterinary school or veterinary nursing school to have animals be afraid of us. We want to help them. And we, you mentioned the positive experience. It's very interesting when I'm in people's practices, in, in practices where they do a lot of procedural sedation. And so the nurses, because those are the ones usually doing the restraint, you know, they don't have that guilt for like sitting on a dog while something painful is right. done or str- scruffing a cat and stretching it out. You know, the nurses, in fact, there's a study that shows that they are much more satisfied with their job if they work in a practice where the animals are not treated roughly under restraint but are actually sedated. That makes a lot of sense because like you said, none of us want, you know, fear and, and heavy restraint and stuff like that for our patients. No, no, that's really, it's again, medically, even if somebody says, well, you know, that's the way I like to do stuff. It's easier for me. I don't think it really is. Um, And we'll talk more about that. I'm sure. But also it's just not the, it's medically, it's not the right thing to do stress has tremendous adverse effects. And especially if that patient has any underlying disease, that stress can exacerbate the negative impact of that disease. So medically, it's not appropriate either. Absolutely, absolutely. So what are some of these procedures that we commonly do with restraint, but maybe we should consider uh, procedural sedation for these? Good question, because it certainly is a wide variety of things. And, you know, in addition to the procedure, the animal itself is part of the decision because sometimes it's actually the stress level of the animal, regardless of what the procedure is. And so, you know, a good example of that for me is lancing abscesses. You and I have seen those abscesses where they're just about ready to pop. There's that soft spot on the top and all we have to do is just tiny stick a scalpel blade in it and everything's gonna come running out and that's all we need to do. Okay, maybe in a lot of animals that level wouldn't require sedation, but let's just say that animal is a cat who is so highly stressed that any amount of restraint makes it very reactive. So even though the procedure was minor, that cat needs some sedation. And then anytime the abscess is bigger and requires a bigger incision and and maybe some debridement and drain tubes, you know, those could benefit from sedation. Oh, removing torn toenails. I don't know about you, Dr. Cassie, but that one just makes me almost cry every time. Oh, yes. Isn't it awful? Because they're so painful and there's three technicians sitting on a dog and the veterinarian says, you know, we just yank that thing off. And yeah, you can, but it's already painful. Now the patient is stressed. And as we mentioned, or I think I mentioned, I'll do it now. If I didn't stress can exacerbate pain, pain causes stress. It's that vicious cycle. And, you know, that dog is screaming. The nurses are devastated. The dog expresses its anal glands. Now the nurses have to spend time cleaning it up. You know, why not sedate that animal? I, that one I absolutely don't understand. And anything in the ears, too. As Ears are so highly sensitive. So removing a grass on from an ear or cleaning ears, especially if they're really painful. That's an obvious one. Those often require anesthesia. But even if you don't think they're that painful, if the animal reacts, sedate it. So really any of those that the animal either is very resistant to even mild restraint or anything that is moderately, obviously to severely uncomfortable or annoying, even if it's just annoying, if it reacts, sedate it. Because we want these animals to be coming back to see us regularly and, you know, doing these follow-up appointments and not, and I I feel like that would be much, much less likely to happen if we have, like we were talking about this pet who's shaking or already, already anxious and upset before it even makes it in the clinic, then, you know, the owners aren't going to want to bring them back. And so maybe, like you said, even if it's not painful, it's just annoying, but now the pet is happier to come back into our clinic, uh, then, then probably everybody's happier to, to come back on a more regular basis. 
I completely agree. And, and you know, it's, it, we're in total agreement and it's not just our opinion. There is research to show that that's true, that as I mentioned, once that animal has experienced some kind of fearful or painful response, then it equates that response with the place that it happened. So right now we're talking about the veterinary clinic and they don't want to come back. They, they know that something bad happened to them. Um, I don't, they know I'm not anthropomorphism or anthropomorphizing, but it is an instinct, an evolutionary instinct for survival to say, don't go there again. And, and then you're absolutely right. That's one of the big things one of the big reasons that owners, especially cat owners, give for not coming into our veterinary clinics is that they don't think that their cat has a pleasant experience at the clinic. So we can make it much more pleasant, A, by doing, when the owner has time, those friendly visits, right, where the animal just comes in to be petted and have a little treat and just enjoy the clinic, but also when we need to do something more invasive to that we can add to the uh, the. I don't want to say satisfaction, that's a human word, but to the, we can make it less fearful and less painful by using this procedural sedation. And then the owner sees that the pet comes out of there happy. And back to your comment about the animal coming in already shaking, that's an animal that needs sedation now. I'm not even going to try. I'm not going to wrestle with that animal. We, that now is already kind of an escalated situation. So obviously that animal already has that fear or that anxiety and we don't want to make it worse. So we use the phrase, don't hesitate to medicate or don't hesitate sedate or whatever it is. The point is we don't want to wait until it's too late to sedate because then we've all already caused that fear and anxiety response so it's too late and also as as you and I both know as everybody listening knows it takes a much higher dose of sedative to control a patient that already has that anxiety and fear response and since the adverse effects of any drug are dose dependent we don't want that high dose we want the lower dose given when that before that animal has that fear anxiety response and we're talking a lot about the, you know, sort of psychological aspects of this, both for the pet and for the pet parent. But what about medically speaking? What are some of the benefits of sedating a patient who might be stressed when they come in? Um, I know you touched on the lower dose of sedation, but also, can you talk a little bit more about the adverse effects of stress in these guys? For sure. So the, and absolutely the lower dose is definitely one. But then if you just think about that stress, that response, stress and pain, and then combined together, they're worse, right? Cause a tremendous negative response for that patient. So we get a number of of systems activated. And one of them is a sympathoadrenal system. So we get that tachycardia, that hypertension, um, everything that goes in with that fight or flight response. So decreased GI motility, uh, catecholamine release, and we get, that can cause catabolism. We get delayed healing because of that stress response. We also get medically uh, on the behavior side or the quality of life side, we get things like anorexia, insomnia, just from that stress response. How many times have we heard that, oh, my dog was in your clinic today and didn't want to eat when it came home? And it wasn't even associated with anesthesia, right? It's just stress or it hit in the corner. Sure. So that, that, that gets to those behavioral effects, which are also medical. They are centrally mediated where an animal gets anxious or fearful or, or even aggressive, right? So we get, we get physiologic responses. We get... Uh, quality of life responses, behavior responses, and all of those fit together in that patient's health picture. What about the owner? So, you know, we, we know there's all these benefits involved, but sometimes it can be hard to talk to a pet owner about giving their pet, you know, drugs. So how do you discuss procedural sedation with pet owners who may be a little bit nervous or resistant to the idea of sedation? You know, that that is such a great question because I think we're doing it all wrong. And I'm I put myself in that boat. I think I'm better now, but we just need to, to rethink how we say this to owners. And actually, we need to start by rethinking like what is our bottom line? What is good medicine to us? What do we want to do with these animals? And then how do we stand behind that and 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 tell the owners why we are doing it? So I think 
we need to approach it more like it's approached in human medicine. And first of all, we just decide what procedures are we 100% sure going to sedate the animal for, even if it's just light sedation. So like back to ears and abscesses and whatever. So that like the, uh, the default would be, yes, it gets sedation. And then, you know, now and then if it didn't need sedation, okay, that would be the abnormal, not the normal, right? So our normal now is procedural sedation with pain management. And again, like in human medicine, we just state that up front, that sedation is required for this procedure. And we discuss the advantages of sedation with the owner, like you and I just talked about, and emphasize to them, as we've, we've just mentioned, it's not only a medical decision, it's also, you know, it's a health decision, it's a quality of life decision, it's a behavioral decision, and that makes it a human animal bond decision. Because as I said, you and I both had those owners, I'm sure, where they, the cat's hiding under the bed after it's been at the vets, or the dog's in the corner hiding, even though we didn't really do anything like anesthesia, like it wasn't major. So really getting them to see the, the, the gamut, the, the big expanse that the, the negative impact of not sedating them can have. And also putting in there the adverse effects of the restraint, as we just mentioned, all the bad things that can happen. And then honestly, in my opinion, the, the owner should not decide. We're not saying, do you want sedation or we might have to sedate, is that all right? We say this procedure requires sedation. So it's not about bad dog, right? We, that's been the problem I think for a long time is we wait till we see that their animal's nervous and then go, oh, your pet's really not gonna like this. How wrong is that? <laughs> I would be so offended that they thought my cat was bad. And <laughs> right, okay, I wouldn't, but we get that. No, but I, I, I agree with you. Yeah, you don't want to hear, oh, you know, they won't cooperate or or something like that. Yeah, and so if we just, we don't even, it, it's not even a decision. Like this is, we, we preordained that in our practice, this is our level of medicine. And don't let the owner decide. They're not doctors. You know, they, they, they will follow our guidance most of the time. And, you know, the parent doesn't get to choose in human medicine. Like, well, do, would you like your child to have an anxiolytic or not? Like that's not an option. <laughs> So I'm not sure how we got there, but I do think we just need to say something like, this is a procedure that will be done under light sedation to decrease anxiety and pain in your pet. You know, like make it all a good thing, all about your pet. This is why. And it, and then just rolled on with it. That is the way it is. And if people, if, you know, if it's the added cost and that's what people are concerned about, just build it into that, that quote. Like this is what we charge for cleaning ears. And that includes the sedation to decrease anxiety and pain in your pet, as, as I already said. And um, you know what, they want to price shop. At some point we have to let them because if you look at, if we let them choose and then it takes three of our nurses 20 minutes of holding down this patient while we clean an ear um, and then the, the stress of the patient, all the bad things that we said, but that also costs us money. Time is money. And three of our nurses trying to hold down a patient for 20 minutes versus sedating it and have one nurse actually doing the procedure that really, that we are allowing the owners to spend our money. And so if they want to have it done elsewhere that doesn't do the procedural sedation, Y'all, I say let them. I'm all for making a buck, but not. But if we look at this, not at the expense really, of good medicine. Right, right, and not at when they are. This really costs us money. Like if you really penciled it out, you would see that it's more expensive. And in fact, have you seen that study by doctors Barletta and Raffi on this topic? I have not. Tell me more. Everybody that's listening to this has to read this article. I mean, it's absolutely amazing. And it's, I just pulled it up. Don't think I have a good memory, but it's called, <laughs> <laughs> it's called behavioral, behavioral response and cost comparison of manual versus pharmacologic restraint protocols in healthy dogs. And it is in the Canadian Veterinary Journal from 2016. So um, what Dr. Barlett and Raffi did is had, had different groups of dogs for minor procedures, as we just said, and they, some were sedate, lightly sedated, some were moderately sedated, deeply sedated, uh, dexmedetomidine, plus or minus butorphanol, right? They had a lot of different sedation protocols and then some just had restraint. And you know, the, the, it's just, it, it's spot on for what we are talking about. And so if anybody in the practice needs more like 
uh, a little stronger push to do more procedural sedation, this is the article for you. If you need to prove to your boss that you can make money doing procedural sedation, this is for you. But here are some highlights of that study. One was that dexmedetomidine plus butorphanol provided better sedation than dexmedetomidine alone. Okay, that's, I think probably all of us know that. Sure. And sure. that the, the restraint dogs had lower cooperation scores. Okay, go figure. They don't want to be restrained. And here's a, a big point that you and I have alluded to. Those cooperation scores got worse as the procedure went along, right? So this, this is escalating, right? It's getting worse and worse for this pet the longer we're restraining it. And it took a longer time to get anything done in the restraint group than in the sedation group. So, you know, we're giving them, them unfortunately, we're forcing them, unfortunately, to be uh, in this situation longer and longer. And the, the nurses had better satisfaction if they were sedated, as I mentioned in, earlier. And here we come back to the money thing. You can make money as shown in this article, like, like by dollar, dollar, they're like they put dollars in there to show you how much you can make by sedating. And we're not talking about charging for the drugs necessarily. We are talking about what you and I just talked about, freeing up your nurses. Instead of having three of them restraining a dog for 20 minutes, you can have one working on the dog for five. Those other nurses are free to do client callbacks, fecal floats, uh, changing a bandage, you know, things that are actually making your clinic money. I think they call them, they're free to do revenue gener generating activities. And it totally makes sense, doesn't it? It does. It does. I think you've made an amazing case for doing this procedural sedation. And I really loved what you said about um, not leaving it up to the owner and not because I think pet owners are incapable of understanding this or making this decision, but um, along the lines of what you said about going about this all wrong in the way that we are explaining it. I know I've found myself in exam rooms talking to an owner and saying, um, you know, exactly like you said, is that okay with you? And then I'm sitting there thinking to myself, is this really fair of me to put this decision on them? Like you said, you know, they're not doctors. They don't have this background and education that, that we have, and they're relying on us to make appropriate medical recommendations. So in that way, I almost felt like this is not really fair of me to put this decision on them. I really need to tell them what I think the right thing is for their pet. I think you've got, I, you hit the nail on the head right there. I, I totally agree. It's up to you, to me. It's up to us as veterinarians to, to give that medical advice and tell them how we are going to do it. And then again, if they want to opt out, then we can come up with a different plan, like maybe with pre-visit pharmaceuticals or something, or really for the procedures like you and I have been discussing, they can opt out and, and, and go elsewhere, but it should not, we should not let them choose the quality of medicine that we practice and the impact that we have on our staff's satisfaction. And, you know, it really is a medical decision to utilize sedatives or not. This is not a, a lay person's decision. And I agree with you and I think they can understand it better. Of course, the pet owners can understand it. But I think they can understand it better when we do present it in the way you and I are talking about as a medical component. And then they go, yeah, okay, like totally getting the medicine versus presenting it as well. That's going to be an extra $75 or whatever it is in every practice. And now we're presenting it as a, an economic decision. Right. And it's, it's not. It's, it's not. You know, it, it really is a medical decision. I completely agree. And you know, moving kind of into this next question, I am really interested in talking about this because I will say this kind of describes me where um, some veterinarians, you know, we might limit our use of sedation or not jump to it right away because sometimes strange things do happen and pets have reactions that we're not expecting. And, you know, we can be scared of the side effects. Can you tell I'm describing myself in some cases, which honestly, <laughs> like with, with my background in anesthesia before going to vet school, I'm honestly a little bit embarrassed to admit this, but, but I have seen some crazy stuff. And sometimes I'm going, well, if I can do it without sedation and then, you know, I don't have to get worried about drug side effects. Um, maybe that would be a little bit better. So what would you say to veterinarians like me? I would say absolutely a normal and common feeling 
Um, and, and I also say, actually, good on you, because if 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 giving drugs of any kind, and especially drugs that impact the central nervous system or the heart, you know, it's things that if they stop, it's really bad. If those drugs don't make you a little twingy every time, like a tiny bit, not maybe not nervous, but a, and a little heightened um, awareness, then probably we shouldn't be using them, right? So it's not an abnormal response. But what I would say to you and everybody else is you are exacerbating your own fear by waiting, right? Because now sure. by the time you've waited, that animal has already got that anxiety fear response. And so now it takes a higher dose of drugs for the drugs to work. And now the, the, the result is always more inconsistent, right? Because we have a lot of excitatory neurotransmitters now circulating because of that fear and stress response. And our sedatives can decrease the release of more excitatory neurotransmitters, but it doesn't take away the fact that there are still some circulating. So now your dose is higher and you're more likely to have a really individual response. So my advice is to just to be, as we've said already, decide ahead of time in your practice what procedures you sedate for and get that pet sedated right away, give the sedatives, then you're more likely to be able to use a lower dose. So you should feel more comfortable. Also, we need to have our nurses with us, right? We, our nurses need to be trained in what the, the effects of those sedatives will be and expect the unexpected. I agree with you. It's not a hundred percent across the board, but certainly we can get it into kind of a bucket of most, the most common normalities and abnormalities that we might see. And then if it's outside that bucket, yeah, run and get the veterinarian, right? But our nurse should be able to gauge those and, and watch that pet. And also we need to monitor. You know, it's amazing to me how many people won't put an ECG on a sedated patient right quick or, you know, blood pressure cuff or a pulse oximeter or really anything. Let's, or a nurse with a stethoscope. You know? <laughs> Probably <laughs> our most valuable tool. Exactly. I don't know why I left that one to last because it's like, wait a minute, this is the best one. And have that nurse with the pet, just like they would be if it was anesthetized. Because remember, we said, that's okay, because we're using one nurse, not three or four to hold this animal down, right? So get that nurse there with you, have them monitoring. And if they're really, really sedate, consider giving them some oxygen by mask. You know, anything that you would support a patient that was lightly anesthetized, think of that for also sedation and, and utilize those monitors and that nurse. And that I think that really helps most people have better peace of mind, A, sedate early, and then B, have a nurse with that pet. You would if it was, again, if you're having to restrain it, you would. So what's the difference there? And also explaining that to the owner. You know, we will have, a, don't say I know sedation is scary, um, but I didn't mean you, I didn't mean that at you. Don't say that. Say, that would be, I would be like, it is scary. <laughs> right, exactly. But I think we should, including me, not say that, you know, I know sedation is scary, but just say sedation is a medical procedure and we will have one of our nurses with your pet the entire time and watching it, you know, monitoring it, watching it, whatever verbiage we want to use. But, you know, that just adds a, a comfort level to, to everybody, to you, to the nurse, to the owner, and obviously to the patient. So yeah, don't wait till it's too late and monitor. Don't hesitate today. Right. right? <laughs> it really <laughs> makes a difference. It does. Does this apply to our patients that are coming in with anxiolytics like gabapentin or trazodone on board? Do we need to be adjusting our doses based on those drugs as well? Sometimes, yes. And that is one of my absolute favorite um, techniques that we use now. You know, we've gotten so much better about using oh, those yes. analytics at home. It, and it really, it matters. It makes a huge difference. That and also all of the gentle handling, right? The careful handling, um, keeping the, the exam rooms quiet, not leaving animals out in the lobby for too long, keeping cats in their carriers while we work with them, right? All of those things that we can do to not have a stressed patient are important. And then when it comes time to sedation, though, I still want you to don't be your own worst enemy and don't hesitate sedate because just because they came in on anxiolytics doesn't mean that that's not enough for any given patient to not have that stress response, right? It may be a decreased stress response, but it can still be that stress response. So obviously, if we're doing something painful, again, sedate. 
But even if it's just for, you know, a really good physical exam and maybe some imaging, sedate if they need it. But here is why, one of my many things that I like about anesthesia is I can see in that patient what sedative or anxiolytics or anesthetic drugs have done, right, as far as level of consciousness. So I have this little goofy rule. I call it my quarter half whole rule. And if the animal had trazodone, or I'm going to give it two backwards, whole, half, quarter. So if the animal had trazodone or gabapentin or dexmedetomidine gel or whatever at home, when it walks into my practice, if it looks like nothing happened, like that animal is just as fearful or just as, as anxious as it was without those drugs, then I give it a whole dose of sedative. And yeah, that might mean that that drug's kicking in later and that that patient takes longer to wake up from sedation, but we have to deal with the patient that's given to us at that moment. And if we wait to see if that drug works, well, we're escalating the stress in the hospital. Plus often the owner took off work to bring their pet in. They're not going to sit around and wait. And so I, so I sedated and I, I love reversible drugs. And so I can take that away at the end. If they come in obviously impacted, so they're calmer, but still very anxious and not wanting restraint, then I give them a half a half dose. And then if they are obviously impacted, but still really like, I, I, I don't wanna be still, you're gonna have to hold me really tight. I, I can't take this. I'll give them a quarter sedative dose. Now, when I say whole half quarter sedative dose, I mean the dose that you use in your practice, right? What dose are you comfortable with? So not like a half of this exact dose, but a quarter or half whole of your dose in your practice. And I use that little algorithm anytime I need to top off sedatives. And you know, Cassie, it really, it works. Most of the time we said there's individual responses already, but not only does it work, I don't have to reinvent it every single time and look at the patient and go, how much more? I don't know, a microgram, two micrograms, quarter, half whole. I really like that because you're right. I do, you know, as silly as it is, because science would say this is not the case, yet it it still seems to be different things seem to work better or worse or differently for, for different veterinarians. And so, like you said, the dose that you're comfortable with, the dose that normally works for you, and then, you know, basing everything off of that amount, I, that, that I agree with you, that makes it a lot easier to conceptualize what you're going to do next. Doesn't it? And, and it shouldn't take you out of your comfort zone. You had a good point there. What are you comfortable with? If you really like light sedation and stick thin with your dosages. If you're like me, I hate wrestling animals. I like deep sedation. I'm sticking with my dosages, but you don't need to use my dosages. Just use my little algorithm. And then, you know, if they really came in and they were very, very calm and required nothing, then I wouldn't, I guess it, so it should be quarter, half, whole, zero if they didn't sure. need it. But if they are going to have something painful, there's never a zero for me, right? I'm still going to give a little bit more like dexmedetomidine or something. That makes sense. So are there any patients that you would not recommend procedural sedation for? Absolutely. And the first patient would be the patient that's going un- undergoing a, a more advanced procedure, a more invasive procedure, or that really can't even be controlled by sedation. So maybe an aggressive patient. Those patients need general anesthesia. So let's just anesthetize them, intubate them, get those monitors going, and then we can go from there. On the other end of the spectrum is the patient that is so ill, so sick, has an unstable disease that they really should not be sedated right now, right? So in those patients, we don't need to utilize procedural sedation today because they don't need a procedure. They first need to be stabilized, IV fluids, going home on pimabendin, like whatever is going on with that patient. But those are our patients that we need to, to make sure that they're really as healthy as they can be before we sedate them. And, you know, we've talked a lot about dexmedetomidine, uh, butorphanol, which makes sense because that is a very common sedative or sedation protocol that we'll use in our patients. But what if that's not quite enough? What are some of our other options that we can use for, uh, for sedation, either in a patient where maybe we need to top off that sedation or add in another drug, or maybe dexmedetomidine is not the safest choice for that patient? Oh, right. You know, and we have... What are, another thing I really like is that we have a number of options for all of those scenarios that you gave. 
but we don't have too many options, right? Yes, <laughs> I <laughs> agree. Of course, we don't have the perfect drug for every patient, but the good thing is we don't have so many that we don't know what to do. So um, with that dexmedetomidine, you're absolutely right. Uh, it, when it's combined with an opioid, as, as the Barletta study showed, we get better, when I say better, I mean more predictable um, sedation and also more profound analgesia. So combining that, that dexmedetomidine with that butorphanol, we pick butorphanol because often procedural sedation is something really short. And so a short duration opioid is, is good. Butorphanol is not our most potent opioid. So we might want to add in things like local blocks, but we should always remember that pick the opioid based on the procedure. So for instance, this just happened this weekend in our own vet clinic. We had a dog come in, they got after a porcupine oh. again, and his head was so again. covered again. You know, <laughs> they don't give up, do they? Once they no. start, <laughs> never give up. So we couldn't intubate him because his mouth was full of porcupine quills as well. So we have him on procedural sedation, but that is so much tissue trauma that we used a more potent opioid. So I'm talking about like methadone, hydromorphone, morphine, right? Something more potent than the butorphanol. So a more potent opioid can help in your scenario. Also adding in a benzodiazepine to the dexmedetomidine and opioid. Remember benzos are not great sedatives unless the animal's really sick. But adding in that little bit of anxiolysis can be just what they need. Again, using your same sedation protocol, but adding in local blocks so the animal is less reactive can be huge. And then any of the drugs, like the anesthetic drugs that can be administered IM can be useful. Now, if you've got a catheter in, you can give anything IV that's an anesthetic drug, right? But which ones are absorbed IM? So now we're talking about ketamine, alfaxalone, and then the teletamine zolazepam combination. And those can either be added to the sedation protocol we just mentioned, or I should back up just really quickly though. If the patient is not sedate enough from my quarter half whole rule or from my standard dose, I will go ahead and give a second dose, right? To try to top it off. So let's just, just pretend I chose 10 micrograms per kilogram of dexmedetomidine, and I see it's not enough, I might not give another 10 unless nothing happened. And I don't know about you, Dr. Cassie, but every now and then I think I inject the drug in the fat or somewhere. Sure. <laughs> yeah. Nothing happens. So if nothing happens, give a whole another 10. If something happened, go to that quarter half whole rule, right? Where is he on the quarter half whole rule? So don't forget to redose. But if that doesn't work or you think it's not going to work, let's pick an aggressive patient. You know, we're not going to keep redosing and try. Right. We need a decision right from the beginning. So in those animals, I would add some ketamine or some of the teletamine zolazepam straight to the other sedatives. If it was like a, a cat who's just moderately stressed or a very small dog, I might add alfaxalone instead of the, the ketamine or the teletamine zolazepam. And then if it's a, a sick cat or a very small dog, like you said, alpha twos may not be the right choice, especially if it's cardiac, and like almost only if it's cardiac, but still, if it's cardiac, we don't want um, to use dexmedetomidine. So then I would use the alfaxalone plus a benzo plus an opioid, or at least the opioid, maybe not the benzo. And then what we get in those patients is the same thing we're talking about. We get procedural sedation. It's just usually not as potent. And it's not potent enough for a really fractious patient, but works great for those ones that are just moderate stress or anxiety. And certainly like we just said for cardiac disease. Sure. And just to go back and clarify something you were talking about earlier with the benzos, uh, were you said that, that little bit of an anxiolytic on board might help? Are you talking about adding that into, say, your uh, butorphanol dexmedetomidine combo or, or some other opioid dexmedetomidine combo? Yeah, or, or into the alfaxalone opioid combo. Okay. The thing is, you know, normally dexmedetomidine is actually, it does decrease that cortisol stress response, that cortisol release from the stress response. So dex, and, and I'm using dexmedetomidine for dexmedetomidine and metatomidine, right? So we work sure. with either one of these. So dexmedetomidine and metatomidine are actually sort of anxiolytics in, a, in the, their mechanism of action, but sometimes they just need a more targeted anxiolytic. So yeah, adding that into that protocol. And I used to be against that. I used to say, why dexmedetomidine is such a good sedative? 
why are people adding in benzos with dexmedetomy? I don't get it. And then I learned all of this that we're talking about, all this fear and anxiety and stress, right? It's not just about sedating the animal. It's what is the impact on that animal? And can we fix it where they want to come back to our practice again, as we started this conversation with? So yeah, just adding it in. Now, just a, a caveat, and I, I know I, I mentioned it, but it really deserves re-mentioning benzos without a sedative or alfaxalone give an IM to really anxious patients or especially fractious patients remember that can backfire because in that situation those benzos can cause a paradoxical excitement and I've seen it um, and it can also do what we call relieve inhibitions and so if that animal is inhibited to bite you and we take that inhibition away with this benzodiazepine then it might be more likely to bite so benzos with an opioid the only time I use that alone is in really sick patients okay otherwise I always have that alpha 2 agonist or the alfaxone or the ketamine or, or something you know it, it, a sedative or an anesthetic drug. And when we're talking about using those anesthetic drugs for procedural sedation, I should remind everyone that it's usually a different dose, right? So for instance, the ketamine, the sedative dose I use is one to two milligrams per kilogram. Whereas the anesthetic dose I am is like five to 10 milligrams per kilogram. So the difference, and same with alfraxone, it's a lower sedative dose than an anesthetic dose. So adding the benzo to one of those protocols is appropriate. Using it alone, unless they're very sick, you are not gonna like it most of the time. Oh, yes. I have seen that happen from time to time, usually as a pre-med or something like that. And it's all, oh, you just feel so bad for them. Isn't it awful? I mean, yes. once you've seen it, I'm like, he was like, okay, we're not going to forget that. That's just awful. Oh, yes. Oh, oh, poor things. We've also talked a lot about local blocks as a form of analgesia. So how can local blocks benefit these patients? Oh, did you notice? I think I was fishing for you to ask that. Like, so I went out local blocks, we could add local blocks. And I mentioned local blocks. <laughs> so thank you for that. Dangling it out there. <laughs> you know, and I didn't mean to be, but I see now. Oh, you know, no. I've been fishing for that. Local blocks, I think, are just the local anesthetic drugs are one of the most underutilized class of drugs that we have. And, you know, we just said, we said earlier, procedural sedation is highly underutilized. Well, local blocks are as well. And if you think about the mechanism of action of local anesthetics, I, I, I have sayings for everything. So I, I call it, it stops pain in its tracks because the local anesthetics work at the transmission phase of that pain pathway. And remember the pain pathway has modulation, transmission, or sorry, transduction, transmission, modulation, and then finally perception. And at every phase except transmission, there are a whole lot of pain generators and pain mediators and pain propagators. So it can be complex to con completely control pain or not possible to completely control pain at any one of those three steps. But in transmission, that painful impulse is, is transmitted up nerves to the spinal cord. And just like every other impulse that's transmitted along nerves, the mechanism is opening of sodium channels. That's how that, that impulse is propagated. And what do local anesthetics do? Block sodium channels, right? And so we really have this pain signal bottlenecked and using those local anesthetics makes a tremendous difference, not only to pain at the moment, so we're much more likely to be able to do something that's painful under light sedation, right? So being back to getting back to being a little bit nervous about sedation, trying to keep those dosages light, but still effective is a, is a really good goal. So using that local block, lower dosages of the sedative, and then also the local block effects last into to recovery from that procedure. So we have a several hour duration of action or like 72 hours if we use the liposome encapsulated bupivacaine. And the other thing we know about local blocks, and this is really cool, is that even after the drug effects have worn off, right, like the drug is for sure gone, patients that have had local blocks will have lower pain scores than patients that did not have local blocks. And it's because of the impact on the pain pathway. The local anesthetics really impact that pain pathway by decreasing those signals that we just talked about. 
the that decreases the likelihood that that central sensitization will occur or central plasticity or some people call it wind up whatever it is it's a huge amplification of that pain in the for, for the patient and that is less likely to occur if we blocked pain while we were causing pain right so blocking it during that painful procedure so you know people if you if we really think about how effective and how cost effective the local blocks are we would realize how often we need to be using those and a lot more often than we do. And then I hear people, oh, it takes time. Okay, come on guys. Most of the blocks that we would use in a patient that is sedated, procedural sedation, would take you seconds to maybe minutes, 30 seconds to two minutes is, would be my window for really all of them. And I would say for the blocks that I do, I would totally agree with that because a lot of what I do is limited to maybe like an intradermal or a dental block or something like that. And I know there's a lot more options out there that would probably really benefit our patients. Are there some good resources that you can point to to help us gain a familiarity with uh, diff just different local anesthetic blocks or regional anesthesia? Absolutely. I'm glad you asked because I think you're right. Getting people comfortable is the way to get more people using local blocks. Because when I'm in practices, where local blocks are, are not being used even close to as much as they should be. And I ask people, why are you not doing this? It's never their heart. It's never their, okay, every now and then long, but we can, we can like you just said, we can overcome that, they're not expensive. But people say they're not in the habit or they don't feel trained. And one of the best ways to get into the habit is to get trained. So the, um, oh, I really quick to a cap, uh, one other procedure that you should be using your local blocks for are those torn toenails, right? Just inject up between sure. those toenails. Yeah, yeah, okay. So back to resources. There are, I'm, I'm going to give you two open access articles and I am not um, saying this because I am the uh, one of the authors on these papers because they're open access. And so I make no money off of this. But I published two local block papers with Dr. Heidi Lowprize, who's a dentist. And in these papers, we actually really go through um, exactly how to do each block. There's a lot of information too on um, the different drugs and dosages and effects. And it's part one and two, because the first one is just a lot about the drugs and the drug effects. And then the second part is really the blocks step by step. And honestly, it may be more detailed than a lot of people want because it seriously is like step by step with pictures where we, we could get those in into the article. And at this exact moment, I am trying to look <laughs> embarrassing. I didn't have this open. I should have had this open. We might have to send this to our readers. But if you just if you, if you search for a grub low prize dental blocks, you'll come up with these two open access papers. Um, the the third one actually has videos with it. And that is if you go to World Small Animal Veterinary Association, so with Sava.org, and then go to the committees tab. This is very critical because it's, it's it's not intuitive that you would click the committees tab when you're looking for local anesthetic blocks, but click committees and then go down to global pain council and you will click on that and you will see a couple of things. One is a really good open access document on all kinds of pain management, pain assessment, uh, pain drugs. And then also there are videos on exactly how to do those local blocks that, that you're talking about some of the more common local blocks so nothing like a video and again this is open access to nothing like a video to to really get you comfortable with doing the blocks yeah and so the the articles are um from wiley so in their online library and as dr cassie said we can just google grub and low prize and those pop up so those two articles and again i feel like i'm bragging on myself but i'm not my goal if i can't find something practical i try to write it so then i can share with people so that's why I'm giving you those and then the videos at wasava.org. And you should be, uh, you know, writing. We're so glad you're writing these things down and sharing them with us. We need these resources. Well, thank you for saying so, because that's how I feel. It's like, okay, I can't find this. I'm just going to publish it. So. I love <laughs> that. I it. <laughs> <laughs> so practical. So let's talk about cats for a minute. You know, we don't want to get flattened by a giant 
dog who doesn't want to be handled, but cats can be equally challenging. I mean, when they get really stressed, it's, you know, we don't want that to happen, but if it does, all of a sudden they have eight legs instead of four and their head is turning 360 degrees and you can't get a hold of them. And it's, it can be really dangerous and then, and scary as the person handling the cat, but of course, very stressful and detrimental to that poor cat. So any specific tips on sedation for cats? Oh, absolutely. And I agree with you. You know, cats are a species that can turn around in their own skin. I really think that they can turn around in their own skin and kill you if they want to. So it is amazing. Yeah, it is. And, you know, I feel for the cat when they react that way, because most cats really aren't that way at home. You know, owners are very surprised most of the time when their cats reacted that way in the clinic. And yeah, there's some cats that they're just, just have a, 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 like a lower threshold than the rest of us. Like, nope, I just have a tiny threshold and you crossed it. But as a species, cats really are a higher anxiety species. You know, dogs are more mixed and not every cat is high anxiety, but across the board, really, they are more likely to have that underlying anxiety. And I can imagine, can, can you think evolutionarily, they don't know their role. Like we are predators. By golly, we eat all those mice in the, in the house, but they're also prey because of their small body size. So, you know, I think even evolutionarily, like they're just totally conflicted. So cats, I'm much quicker to, to do the procedural sedation, even than in a dog because I know they are high anxiety and we all know about kitty minutes. And there are very few kitty minutes. And as you and I discussed using our gentle handling and the pre-visit anxiolytics and all that kind of stuff, buy us a few more kitty minutes. But still when that cat is done, they're done and cats are really done. So when we continue to try to force them, things escalate for them very, very quickly. And they are the classic in, in my practice, and I'll bet yours too, for going home and then hiding under the bed for a week. You know, they, they just, it was such a horrible experience for them that it, it totally impacts them long-term and impacts that human-animal bond and makes the owner not want to bring them back. You know, if, if the owner said to me, or if I was the cat owner and my cat hid for five days under the bed, or even one day, after the vet visit, I, you know, I wouldn't want to bring it back. I could see that that was a terrible experience. So cats in general, uh, in my hands, more often are on the pre-visit anxiolytics and are much, I'm much quicker to sedate them. Now, if it's something that can be done another day, so we got our, our quick physical exam, but we didn't get an orthopedic exam for osteoarthritis pain, for example, but, um, fine, let's send them home everything's good now, we'll increase their dose of gabapentin and bring them back next week. But so often that's not what it is. It's something we really need to get done today. Even if it's a blood draw to recheck thyroid levels or something, you know, just a light sedation really will help you get that kitty calmer and get your job done without getting your nurses scratched and bitten. And again, when that cat reacts that way, scratching and biting, I, some people get angry at the cat. And I think you and I are like, I feel bad for the cat that we put them in that situation. So use those anxiolytics at home and then just be quick to sedate them if you need to. Yeah, absolutely. Because that, um, that cortisol kicks in or the adrenaline kicks in and, um, and then they're not going to show you what they're going to show mom and dad at home. Right. When they're relaxed and moving around and jumping or not jumping and stretching, right. not stretching, I can really see how the pain is impacting that cat. Whereas once they're in their carrier, yes, I can palpate them and I can try to get them to move around the exam room, but generally they won't or they just hide. And then anywhere you touch them, often they just stiffen up. And so just getting that, that picture of how that cat, that normal behavior for that cat at home really helps us understand cats and can make a medical difference in things like pain assessment. That, yeah, I have a little bit of experience in the mobile, in the house call world, and it was a very eye-opening experience for me for how I approach uh, and, and manage cats in the clinic, because I also work in a brick and mortar clinic. And I think, you know, that provides a very important resource for pet owners as well. But, you know, my husband is incredibly allergic to cats, so I don't have a cat, so you know, at, at one point in my career, a 
stressed out cat and really having to restrain and do these things was very normal for me. Cause in my mind, you know, I, I, this is how, this is just how it is with a cat in the clinic. But then when I went and I handled them in their own environment and saw the difference in how much lower their stress levels were, it changed my whole approach to how I managed them in the clinic and said, oh, it doesn't have to be this way. We can bring them in on gabapentin and do these quiet, gentle handling techniques and avoid these types of situations. And like you said, sedate early before they get worked up. And, you know, you have a cat who's now climbed on your head and, and terrible things are happening. <laughs> yeah. Generally on your head is a bad, if a cat's on your head, it's a bad day for the cat. Especially. Yes. I speak from experience <laughs> on that one. <laughs> and, and I, I a hundred percent agree with you. Cats are, are in general, again, just across species, not all individuals, but across species, they, because they're higher stress, they're very different at home than they are in the clinic. And good for you for, for, for seeing that and then changing the way that you treated cats in the clinic or handled cats in the clinic or when you sedated cats in the clinic. And, you know, as, as a person who does a lot of pain consultations, I, I, I really highly rely on knowing the behavior of that cat at home to make a pain assessment. So I love when owners send in videos for me of that cat, you know, so I can see its mobility. I can see it. Is it eating? I can see is it hiding in its own environment where I'm not the stressor and the hospital isn't the stressor. So that can make a difference in some of our diagnoses for things like pain is seeing that cat at home. And, you know, the, the, uh, other place that I think is great for low stress for, for cats is a lot of the cat only clinics because they don't have those barking dogs in their lobby. And so that can, you know, that can make a difference for a cat as well. Cats are just different species. I'm not sure they're from this planet. I love my cats, but I, I'm st I still think they're, uh, they're spies from an another galaxy. I, really I have to agree with you. Cause like you said, they're just like confused little animals. Like I had somebody describe them as a prey species the other day. And I was like, well, I guess that's true, but they're also, you know, pretty serious predators. And, right. um, Maybe that's the explanation. It's just they're they're little aliens from some other place. <laughs> it certainly seems to fit, especially the way that sometimes they just stare at you. And I, I really think that they're sending data back to their home planet. Um, I think you might yeah, be onto something. Thought of that because it's like, why are you staring at me? <laughs> I'm going to tell you that my cats can outstare me. You know, like the blink thing. I blink first. I can. I cannot outstare my cats. Oh my goodness! I believe it. I believe it. They can be intense. <laughs> Um, well, I love, I think all this information is fantastic. It's so wonderful. Are there any case examples or stories you want to talk about um, that maybe give a good example of how to put all this knowledge into practice? Absolutely. Maybe we could just summarize it. You know, I, we went through a few cases like ears and abscesses and just taking into account the stress of the animal as well. Um, you know, minor lacerations with sutures, those torn toenails are a big deal. Oh, and like paw pad lacerations, any of those things, anything that will require in that patient moderate or worse, moderate or more intense restraint, right? If it's just really light sedate, sedate uh, restraint, maybe go ahead, but don't forget about pain. The other thing with pain is even if we're doing a procedure that's not painful, like imaging, we might be causing that patient some pain. And the example, the case example is a patient with osteoarthritis, with, with pre-existing osteoarthritis, and we're trying to image it, and we're stretching it, and twisting it, moving it, and we are often causing pain at that moment. So not only addressing that pain that we are exacerbating, but also going, wait a minute, this is only imaging, I just did only in air quotes, only imaging, but the patient needs sedation. So don't forget that it may not be the procedure, it can be the patient. So, you know, that's what I would, I would kind of summarize up, just provide sedation and analgesia or the procedural sedation analgesia really for any procedure that would require moderate to severe restraint, regardless if that restraint is required for the procedure or the patient. And then consider using reversible sedative drugs so that you can send them back home with the owner if you want to. I don't always reverse, but if you want to, to send them right back home and don't forget adding in the analgesia like the local blocks. And, and we, I just want to bring this back up to build the cost of that procedural sedation into the charges. Don't let the owner decide. Just present it as this is what we do here. 
And then my final summary statement is if you, when you do all that, when you make your decision about what, what patients will be sedated and do all the things that we just said, and you are prepared to do this consistently, you will get more efficient procedures. You will get happier staff, happier owners, happier patients, and you will make more money according to Dr. Barletta and Rafi. It's published. So, you know, it's just a win, win, win situation. Everybody wins. Everybody wins. Well, I'm so glad that we had this talk because this is definitely something that I think we all could be doing more of. And um, just remembering the different, the different modalities we have to help reduce stress and discomfort. And like you said, just make it a win, 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 a better scenario for everybody. Absolutely. I think that should be the goal of every veterinarian, every veterinary nurse, every pet owner, right? That's, we want the win, win, win for all of us. Well, Dr. Grubb, thank you so much for joining me today. This has been fantastic. Thank you for all of the information. Thanks back. I really enjoyed the conversation and your insight and your experiences as well. That's how we learn is when we share experiences and share knowledge. Absolutely. Couldn't agree more. All right, everyone, I hope you took away some great information from that episode. I know I did. I want to say a big thank you to Dr. Grubb for joining us and to DECRA for sponsoring this episode. For more episodes like this, click on the Education tab on the Vetfolio website. As always, we'd love to hear your input on this episode as well as ideas for topics you'd like to hear from us in the future. Feel free to reach out to me at dvm at vetfolio.com You can also visit my Facebook page at Dr. Cassie DVM, and you can find me on LinkedIn. And remember, if one animal is better off because of you today, it's a great day. Mm